over in the book of Acts. I'm kind of excited about the message. Uh, it's one of these things where anytime I get to to, to kind of walk with the Apostle Paul and some of his um, some of his adventures, I like to call, or I guess you could say some of the things that the Lord had put him through, it excites me. I don't know what it is. I love to study the Bible. I love to talk about the Bible. I just love the book of Acts and how the Lord brings all this stuff to life. It's amazing to me when we start studying the book of Acts how exciting it truly is. So if you find your place, look in Acts chapter 27. My scripture is going to be taken from verse 27. 21 there. When you find your place, you don't have to stand up or anything tonight. Just amen me so I know it's time to go. Alright. So in verse 21 it says, But after a long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not loose from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, whose I am and who I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be, even as it was told me, how be it, we must cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as they were driven up and down in Adara, about the midnight the ship men deemed that they were draw, to draw near to some country, they sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone and went a little further and sounded again, they found it to be fifteen fathoms. And when f then fearing least that we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast an anchors out of the stern which wish for the day. And the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship when they let down the boat into the sea under the color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. Paul said unto the centurion and to the soldiers, Except ye abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes off the boat and let her fall, and let her fall off. Let us pray. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for getting us here tonight, Lord. Thank you for the book of Acts. Lord, I ask you to bless me tonight. Give me the gift of teaching and preaching just for a little while. Lord, your servant's here and ready to hear you speak, Lord. I ask these things in your Son, Jesus' most precious name. You get all the glory and honor for anything said or done. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right. Notice with me in, in Acts chapter number 27 here. Looking at verse 21, the man of God was absent. You know, the Apostle Paul was riding with these men in the ship, and as this storm was going on, and all these days dragged by, and the, the, as the ship was tossed and turned and thrown about, the, the man of God was missing. I like that fact when I read through here. I noticed that this talked about a long absence of him being away from these men. So when I thought about the Apostle of Paul by being there and being away from these men, I'm thinking these men probably were kind of a little bit concerned. Where's Paul? I guess it was not Paul's place to be right up in the middle of them. He was truly a prisoner of there. But I'm expecting to think being part of the Roman government and how they did things, the prisoners were the ones that probably powered the ship and rode the ship and you know rode the ship and took care of the things of sailing and stuff. So when they, even though they were prisoners, they had to serve on the ship. But the apostles also, Paul had, a, he had been away for a long absence. Now, when he shows up in verse 21, when he's talking to these men here, he reminds them of his warning. It's kind of one of these things. It's not where the Apostle Paul was just kind of dragging something up. But the fact of it was, when I read it, every time I read it through, you know, it's kind of some of these times when you and I talk to even our kids, we want to remind them of something we've told them, not to just drag it back up. But it's one of these things where we would like them to know that, hey, I told you this before, so the next time I have something important to tell you, remember that I was right on this one here. I'm not trying to bring it up and be 
beat a dead mule here. I was right on this one here. So the next time I tell you something, I hope you'll pay more attention to me next time. But that's what the Apostle Paul, he reminded them. And you say, Brother Walker, why is that important? We got to keep in mind these people were planning to ship or planning to sell out of this area that they were in. Uh, if I understand my Bible and the geography of where they were, they were in this place called the Fair Havens is where they were. And when they wanted to leave out of this thing out of the coast of Crete, they really were in a place where they didn't have a whole lot of anything. You think about it, it's kind of a, you know, a small fishing areas and villages and stuff like that. And they got these Roman soldiers there and these men and they're wanting to leave out of this area just because, you know, the area didn't have a Starbucks, so to speak. I mean, really didn't, nothing there. It was just kind of like a, you know, just a small area. So these men were in a hurry to get back to the big city when you think about it. Now, when I thought about that, the Apostle Paul was in well in his rights to kind of remind them, hey, don't you, you remember what I said? We shouldn't have left out. We should have stayed put. It was already late in the year when they decided to go. That's how it was. So the Apostle Paul was reminding them of something that they should have taken heed to him before. Now see, that to me is important because the Apostle Paul later on is going to give them a little more instructions on some things and then they paid him attention then. But the fact of it was, he wasn't bringing it up just to you know, throw it in their face or whatever you want to call it. He was kind of reminding them, hey man, I've been right so far. So next time I say something, Pay me some more attention, basically, what it, where I got out of it when I read it. In verse 22, Paul has good news. He tells them to cheer up, amen. Now, these boys in a storm and the ship's tossed and here to and fro and they're scared and it's dark. You know, how can you cheer up? But the Apostle Paul shows up in a very cheery way and tells them to cheer up. Verse 23, you know, you and I today, we can really understand what Apostle Paul was going from because we have the rest of the story. We honestly do. But the Apostle Paul tells them where uh, that everything was going to be okay and why. Uh, he was alone there with God praying, I'm assuming he was, when the angel of the Lord shows up and gives him some insight on what was going on. Basically tell him that, hey, you know, where you headed, Paul, you got to show up for Caesar. You know, don't worry about it for where we're going to end up. You got to be there. Not only that, in verse 26, we see where the Lord, via the angel, told the apostle Paul, there's a certain island that you got to visit. Not only, hey, Paul, you're going to have to stand in front of the, the kings and the leadership there in Rome. This is where you're headed. you got to stand trial. Not just that, but hey, there's a certain island that you're going to end up on. Now, if you were to read on a little further there in, in Acts chapter uh, 28, you'd see that they ended up on the island of Melita. Uh, the very interesting area there is kind of an island that's known for the sweetness of honey. They got some special honey bees or something there in modern day this island. But the fact of it is, that's where they were headed. It really was. God saw fit to give the Apostle Paul the insight. The fact of it was, there's a certain island you're going to end up on. That's all in God's plan. It really was. Paul's telling them to cheer up. In verse 27, we can see that they were lost. These people were in a peril. They honestly were. Uh, in verse 28, we see how they knew they were in danger. They honestly were. They were desperate, very desperate. And having some idea of ang uh, the danger that was ahead of them, they honestly were. Um, notice in here where it says, When the 15th, uh, 15th night was come, as we were driven up and down, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that we drew near to some country. Now, it's something, you know, you and I don't think about unless you've been a sailor. Maybe you've been in the Navy or something. But the fact of it was, if you're in a storm and you can't see anything at all, your biggest fear is the storm driving you up on a mountain of rocks and stuff and crashing you into it. Uh, many, many ships have gotten shipwrecked just for that fact. The winds blow them into these places. You know, that's the reason we have lighthouses because lights would houses would show people where the rocks were. The storms would bring folks in. The amazing thing about these islands and these areas there, uh, these little, like the Mediterranean Sea especially, they kind of create their own weather around these islands. Funny thing about it is the currents move around these islands in weird ways, but the fact of it was is at dark time when you can't see where you're going, it's really dangerous for the fact of it was the storms would grab a hold of these ships, drag them into shore, and then crash them against rocks, against the beaches, against land. But that was the fact of it was these men were afraid, and they knew what was coming because... You know, if you can't see where they're going, 
They have no idea what they're fixing to run into. That's the truth there. Amen. So in verse 30, they were trying to make matters worse by taking things into their own hands by letting down this, what I call a lifeboat here. The Bible calls it a boat. I'm assuming it's a lifeboat. It's probably this small little skiff or vessel. They tried to throw down this lifeboat. So I get the understanding they let this boat down. They couldn't even see it at all. It's kind of one of these things where uh, I'm thinking when these boys, they just threw this lifeboat out of this, out of this ship here and it, uh, it just went away in the darkness is basically what it was. My thought was probably they threw it out of the boat and the waves were so f coming up so high on the sides of the ship that it probably just overfilled it with water all at the same time. And now the boat really is just hanging loose on the ship, causing it to be more of a hindrance than a help at all. It wasn't going to do them any good to even try to get in this boat, but that was something they took upon themselves to try to save themselves. They truly did. The boat was nothing more than something somewhat like an anchor, kind of in the way, a hindrance. Uh, in verse 31, the Apostle Paul explains that to to be saved, you must stay in the ship. Verse 32, we see where the soldiers finally cut the ropes of the boat and let it go. When you think about this right here, they gave up their lifeboat. They honestly did. They really did. Once the decision was made to cast it over and to use it, the, the boat was likely just lost in sea right up front. It really was. So what did they do? They had to cut ties of it. They had to let it loose and let it go. They honestly did. At this point, having it tied to the main ship was nothing more than a way of slowing the ship down. They were going to try to steer this vessel at all. Believe it or not, the boat was going to be something that was going to fight them in every way it truly was. No matter which way you'd send the rotor, no matter which way you'd set the sail, if this boat was clanging down in the water and hanging on stuff and hanging on water, it was going to do more steering than their stern would. Amen. So tonight I'll give you six truths that every Christian should take to heart any time you find yourself in a storm. Now I'm not drawing a peril to the storm that we just had of the hurricane or whatever. I'm just saying when a Christian has a storm and you as a Christian will be in a storm probably most of your life. You honestly will. There's always storms. There's storms with family. There's storms with problem. There's storms with finance. There's storms with health. There's storms with having to deal with other people. There's even storms in churches. But as a Christian tonight, here's your six truths that I, help, that, that I hope that will help you. Anytime you find yourself in a storm. Number one, and we get this example right from the Apostle Paul. Notice that he was alone with God. Now, time alone with God, and I've said this probably this morning too, time alone with God builds our relationship with Him. No doubt about it. That's how we get stronger. That's how we get closer to Him. We draw nigh to Him. That builds our relationship with Him. How can you know what He expects if you don't draw nigh to Him and have a relationship with Him? with him. So notice when the ship was in the storm, the Apostle Paul was likely fasting in prayer. You say, Brother Walker, how do you know that? Well, it tells us in the Bible they, weren't been, they hadn't been eating anything at all. So if the Apostle Paul was alone in a storm, he was praying. You say, Brother Walker, how do you know it? That, well, I can tell you this much. If it were me, if it were you, we were on a storm, there's nothing we can, we were on that ship all by ourselves in that storm. There's nothing you and I can do. We wouldn't be playing with our smartphone and we wouldn't be doing, we would be trying our best to get as close to God as we could. You say, Brother Walker, how do you know? I know that for a fact because I know that's what I would be doing. I would be trying to draw an eye to the king. I'd be looking, hey Lord, hey, we're getting beat up here. Need some help, Lord. Watch out over here. Guide this ship. That's what I'd be praying. So that a long time Time that the Apostle Paul had with God was profitable for him. Spend time in fasting and prayer. Amen goes there. You know, it's one of these things where fasting does all of us good. Uh, I guess unless you have uh, diabetes or have sugar problems or whatever, fasting is kind of a tricky thing. But you as a person sometimes, fasting, intermittent fasting for normal people is a good thing every once in a while. Deny yourself of a little bit of food for a little bit of time, it never hurts you. It honestly doesn't. If you have low blood sugar that pops out on you, that's kind of a deal. But when it comes to fasting, there's other ways of fasting. There's it really is. Uh, I know with me, I will fast from social media for a while. You say, Brother Walker, do you have a problem with social media? No, I really don't. But the fact of it is, it distracts me a lot of times when I could be spending more time in my Bible. Amen. It honestly does. My wife, uh, 
was never one to want Facebook or whatever and we had a bunch of junk for sale. I think Brother Tommy has seen this stuff. Well, I'm, I shouldn't say junk. Sorry about that, darling. My father-in-law had some stuff that uh, we're trying to kind of get rid of to kind of help with some of his medical expenses and stuff and antiques and stuff. And I, I'm not an antique buff, so I shouldn't have called it junk, but the fact that was my father-in-law had a bunch of antiques and st things of that nature. So my wife's like, I, I need to sell these antiques and stuff and it'll help out with other things and it was a good idea. But the fact of it was, Craigslist's no good anymore, so Facebook Marketplace is where you want to be. You know, so she ended up getting her a little account set up for that, but the fact of it is, she's like, I get all these notifications saying somebody posted this and that, and I say, just ignore it. Just ignore it. And what I'm saying that for is like for me, I use Facebook for certain things like uh, trying to get prayer requests on Saturday morning. I try to keep up with some of my preacher friends, but I'm not addicted to it, right? I want you to know that. But the fact of it is, uh, there's times when it's nothing but a distraction. And so it's important for me sometimes to say, I'm not getting any notification from this social media. I'm turning this thing off until I get all my other stuff done or I'm going to turn it off until Friday and then I'll look at it. That's good. That's fasting. That's a way to deny yourself of looking at things like that. I don't know about you, but I have people that I know real well. I love them to pieces. They can sit for hours with their phone just flipping through stuff. Flipping through these little short videos. Videos of cats. Videos of dogs. and Videos of monkeys. Monkeys, I mean, literally, all these little videos, these, you know, nothing, nothing, you know, evil or nothing they shouldn't really be looking at, just silly entertainment stuff. But these little videos, they just take up your time. They eat up your time, and the time that they eat up takes you away from reading your Bible. I mean, literally, you could be spending some time with the king if you weren't looking at these videos. A lot of us get responsible for that, too. So when you think about that, there's things you can deny yourself of. Social media is one. It truly is. Well, I got a lot of friends that like to watch TV. I don't have a TV. I admitted it this morning in uh, Sunday school. I just don't watch TV. The best thing ever happened to me is our TV's not work anymore. Amen. Because my mind ain't warped to what the media wants to tell me anymore. I totally have. I think for myself a lot more. Let me put it that way. I honestly do. I let God guide me and I think for myself because I don't watch much news or TV. But the fact of it is, if you're a junkie hooked up on the TV and that's all you... You could do some fasting to keep yourself away from the TV from time to time. It's good for you. Why is that? Because the time you're away from that, you have a clearer mind on other things as well as that'll give you time to spend with the king. That'll give you time to spend in your Bible. Fasting is a good way to do that. Amen. Time alone with God builds relationship. Fast from those things that take your time away from Him. Amen. Because here's the deal. He is the most important thing we have. He really is. We don't have nothing any more important than spending time with Him. At some point in our lives, you and I, all of us, are going to pass away. It's going to happen. Ain't none of us going to live forever. You ain't going to get out of here alive. Amen. You ain't going to get out of here without paying taxes too, but you definitely ain't going to get out of here alive. So the fact is... We need to be spending time with the king because we're going to be spending time with him in eternity. We might want to know something about him. We might already want to have a relationship with him. We honestly do. We truly should. Fasting's important. In Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. Amen. Well, he gives us an outlet to pray. Amen. He gives us an outlet to ask him. Uh, he's got an open door for us. I mean, he honestly does to let him know our needs. Well, it's amazing to me, the Lord already knows the stuff that we need, but he wants to hear us ask. Amen. He honestly did. I might have told you this about my father. My father was a wonderful dad. I mean, he's strict on me, hard on me, and I ain't complaining about that. I needed it. Amen. I'm glad he whomped me when I needed a whomping. I guarantee you. I'm glad he whipped me. I think back about the whippings I got. Some of them I don't think were fair, but the older I get, the more I feel like, yeah, they were fair. I needed them. Amen. But my dad, he loved for me to know he was my dad. 
Amen. I remember when I was dating my wife, I'd work with my dad on the roof. We'd be busy all week. And there'd be times when I'd have a whole lot in my wallet. And I wouldn't never spend everything I had. I just was never that kind of person. The fact of it was, and my dad would say, uh, what you going to do tonight? I said, I don't know, Dad. I'd like to, I'd like to go get a hamburger with Heather. And he's like, well... You need some money? I'm like, yes, sir. If you don't mind, let me borrow a little bit. And he would. He'd give me a little money, and I'd get to go take my sweetheart out to get a hamburger. The fact of it was, my daddy liked for me to ask him. He liked to, for me to know that if I needed something, I could come to him. Well, you know, God is way more more than that. You know, He knows what you need, but sometimes you just need to spend time alone with Him and talk to Him and ask Him. Why is that? Because He's your Heavenly Father. And here's something else. You know... People ask for such little, measly things. They really do. Do you do that? I do it a lot. But the fact of it is, you ain't never going to bankrupt God. Amen. He's got the cattle on millions of hills. Every penny, every ounce, every copper, every gold in this, in this world is His. Every speck of dirt, everything of sand, it all belongs to Him. There's no way you'll ever bankrupt Him. So if you need something, matter of fact, if you even want something, ask Him for it. He might just give it to you. Amen. Alright. So when we're spending the time, time alone with God, remember what we were talking about this morning actually. We spend time in our Bible. Amen. It's important. Every Christian should spend as much time in our Bible studying and learning about the King as possible. Why is that? Because we need a relationship with Him. Why is that? Well, we need to be drawing nigh to Him. We need to be getting closer to Him. In Isaiah chapter number 55, verse number 6, the Bible tells us, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. In Psalms chapter 145, verse number 18, the Bible says, The Lord is nigh unto them that call upon Him, and to all that call upon Him in truth. Amen. If you and I are seeking the Lord, you know, it's kind of one of these things where it's all on our side to draw nigh to Him. He's made the offer. The door is open. All you and I have to do is seek Him, and we can draw as close to Him as we want to. Amen. Every Christian today... You know, we don't realize what a blessing it is to have this old book right here. Every Christian has a Bible in their hand, or they really should. You know, some of them don't really have the right Bible. Some of them just have a book in their hand. But I mean, like with me, I'm so blessed to have this. Matter of fact, I got two or three King James Bibles. I honestly do. But the fact of it is, that right there is such a blessing. This thing has the mind of God in it. It truly does. Tells me all about Him. Tells me what He expects out of me. Tells me how to live. And it's kind of one of these things. When I want to get close to Him, here's the outlet right there. Amen. I can get as close to Him as I want. I can spend time with Him anytime I want through His Holy Word. Amen. What a blessing it is to have His Holy Word. It truly is. In Psalms 119, verse number 105, it says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. His Word is a light unto my path. Amen. That's what guides me. It truly honestly does. In Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, My son, forget not my law, but thine but let thine heart keep my commandments. You and I have God's commandments in front of us. Amen. Draw nigh to what He's put in there for us. Number two tonight. This is an interesting one. Trust in God and He'll calm the storm. Amen. No matter what we have going on in our lives, He is the one you and I should run to. No matter what troubles we're in. When you think about the Apostle Paul in the midst of this storm and all that was going on, he was alone with God drawing nigh to him. Well, the thing that just gets me all tickled about it is, you know, I don't know why, but when I play this out in my mind as what was going on, I see the Apostle Paul kind of walking out on the, on the deck of the ship and he says, uh, you boys should have listened to me. And after they looked at him and said, yeah, yeah, we should have listened to you. He says, but fear not. He's just as cool as a cucumber. I mean, I see him in my mind. Even though the storm's raging and the ship's beating, battered and beating back and forth, the Apostle Paul here sounds just as cool as anybody. I mean, he's up cool as, cool as a cucumber. Fear not. I done met with God. God told me what the plan is here. Don't worry about it. All of us will be. There's not a hair on your head that's going to be out of place when this is over. Amen. But the fact of it was, he was drawing nigh to God. Trusting in God will calm the storm. And honestly, 
honestly would. Amen. He had been alone with God, came to pray, knowing what God and knowing that God was in control. That's what he was resting in. While the storm was raging, was it rough? Yes, it was. Amen. Was the waters high and dangerous? Absolutely. But the Apostle Paul was trusting in God. And the fact is, Paul trusted in what God told him and what God was doing. Amen. You know, Paul was just simply trusting in God and what God had promised. you got to know something. When God gives you a promise, He doesn't back up on it. He truly, honestly doesn't. Psalms chapter 46, verse number 10, the Bible says, Be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. Amen. And even Romans in 8, 28. Remember this one here? Y'all probably have it memorized. And we know that all things, hallelujah, all things. It didn't say just a couple or two. It says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Amen. Amen goes there. And I know Brother Tommy's going to say, I know preacher's favorite verse. It could possibly be Proverbs chapter number 3, verse number 5, where it says, Trust in the Lord <laughs> with all thy heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. Hallelujah. Amen. You and I, we can run to the king in times of need, in times of storm. He will calm the storm. He honestly will. Number three, seek God's will and know that he'll guide your steps. Like in verse 24 here, the apostle Paul says, fear not, Paul, or the angel is talking to Paul, it says, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, I have given thee all that sail with thee. Amen. So when the Apostle Paul was walking close to God, he was walking in God's will, he was protected. He honestly were. He was protected, his steps were guided, his steps were numbered. Amen. In Matthew chapter 6, verse number... 33, the Bible says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The Apostle Paul had the right idea. He was seeking what God's will was for him. He truly, honestly would. Every step that the Apostle Paul took was numbered by God. God had him exactly where he needed to be, even though he was in a storm. He honestly did. Psalms chapter 37, verse number 23 tells us, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Amen. When your steps are ordered by God and you're walking the way he wants, you're, you're happy because he's taking care of you. You're trusting in him because you know he's got your best interests at heart. Amen. All right, number four tonight, another truth for us. You know, we must stay in the ship. I know that sounds a little bit silly, might even be a little cliche, but we got to stay in the ship. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, the thing about this right here is when we're in a storm and when the troubles come, we got to stay close by the Lord. We got to stay in Him. We honestly do. In verse number 31, when Paul talks to these soldiers here, Paul said to them, Except ye abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Amen. So if these boys would have made it out to that little lifeboat they were planning to get in, they would have perished. They honestly were. Hell. They were in a huge storm. They were lost at sea. They were in a storm and the fight of their lives. I know many of these men probably seeing that storm and that water raging, they were probably scared to death. They honestly were. It was dark. It was a storm. It was gloomy. Uh... I don't know how you guys, have, have you ever been around some salty water and then get it all over you and it get cold and it's just, just uncomfortable and nasty? I mean, it's one of the most horrendous, nasty. You'll be, you'll be dying for a, cold, a warm shower to get out of that nasty, salty water. That's where these boys were. They were miserable in this storm. They honestly were. So their poor decision caught up with them. It truly, honestly did. Their poor decision come to a head. The end was near for these boys. They were about to take upon them themselves by fleeing in that boat and if they'd have done that they would have perished they were trying to do it on their own with that lifeboat they honestly were Apostle Paul tells them they got to stay in the ship. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 18, the Bible says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for these which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. Being secure in Christ and putting all your trust and care in Him is the way that the Apostle Paul got through this. Honestly did. Amen. Uh, I am sure that they were all feeling scared, but the fact of it was, as a Christian, we have to go to what we know and not how we feel. Amen. That's important. I know they were scared. 
I know they were miserable. They, go, they had to go with what they know, what, Apostle Paul, what the Apostle Paul told them. That's what they went with. Amen. They would gotten that lifeboat all to their own. They would have been perished. They truly would have. So in the Bible, the, the Bible promises things to us. The things that the Bible promises is true. God's Word says it. What He said, He'll never break a promise. Amen. Amen goes there. Now when you think about it, who is the author of confusion? I think the devil would be the author of confusion and not God. In Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 1, the Bible tells us, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had, God had made. You know, Satan uses fear to cause us grief. He honestly does. So when we have these storms coming... No fear. Just put the trust in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible tells us, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but the power of, of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Amen goes there. Number 5 tonight. I love this one here. Now you and I would do real well, especially me. I'm talking, preaching to myself tonight. This one here hit me hard when I thought about it. But number 5 is to cut it loose. What do you mean by that? Well, the things that hold us back, the things that get between us and God, sometimes you and I, we just have to just totally cut it loose. Amen. In Acts chapter 27, verse number 20, uh, 32, the Bible says, Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Amen. <laughs> you know, there will be loss, there will be pain, there will be sickness, there will be a time of sadness. I truly will. There will be times of hopelessness. There will be a, a, where, where times where people will upset us. There will be times when people let us down. There will be times when people will lie to us. There will be times when people will steal from us. There will be times when people will say things about us. But the fact of it was is all these things that happen to us, if we carry that junk around, it just ties us down. That's all it does. There's a time in our life when you and I, at some point, we need to cut these things loose. We honestly do. At some point, we just have to simply let these things go. The Bible tells us to be quick to forgive. Amen. That's very important. Always be quick to forgive. Why is that? Well, you know, God forgave us of all kind of stuff. I don't know about your sin, but I know about my sin. But the fact of it was, God forgave me for every one of them. So when someone sins against me, the best thing for me to do is be quick to forgive. Amen. Let it go. Cut it loose. Let it free. Amen. In Ephesians chapter number 4, verse 31, the Bible tells us, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Amen. That thing called bitterness is a problem. And believe it or not, that thing called bitterness is a big stumbling block for a lot of Christians. Amen. You and I have to cut that loose just like they did this old lifeboat here. Quit holding on to these sort of things. Every Christian every day should become... More sweet and less bitter. How do we do that? By getting rid of the things that cause us to be bitter. Amen. Absolutely. When I thought about this, I thought about somebody in my family. You know, you say, Brother Walker, talk about your family a lot. Well, that's what I have experience with. But here's the trick. I got a cousin one time got mad at my daddy, and they still mad at us today. Why did he get mad at my daddy? Well, my daddy wouldn't let him borrow his tractor. My daddy had a tractor. They didn't. They wanted to borrow it. My daddy's like, uh-uh, I don't, I don't loan my tractor. There was times when my daddy didn't have nothing but a tractor. I mean, put it that way. I mean, literally, my daddy didn't have a raggedy old car. Sometime he had a raggedy old pupwood truck. But he had this old tractor, old 1010 John Deere. I think it's a 52 model or something. I still got it, amen. But there was times when that's all my daddy had was a tractor. And he didn't let nobody borrow it. Because he didn't want nobody tearing it up. Honestly, my cousin got mad about that. He's still mad today. Amen. Daddy wouldn't let him borrow a tractor. That bitterness that he had, because my daddy had a tractor, he didn't have one. And I don't know what it was. He thought maybe my daddy owed him something. I don't know. Daddy didn't. But the fact that was, they still mad about that today. Amen. I'm not mad about it. I feel sorry for them. Because they've spent their entire life being bitter over somebody letting them borrow a tractor. That's the silliest thing. When they could have cut that loose and drawn nigh to the king and moved on in life. But every Christian is subject to having that same problem happen to them that truly are. So every Christian every day should be becoming more sweet and less bitter. Amen. In Hebrews chapter number 12 verse number 15 the Bible tells us, looking diligently lest any man should fall of grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. 
and thereby many be defiled. Amen. Well, you know, it's kind of one of these things. You, you and I, if we're trying to walk as a Christian, there's going to be somebody that's going to upset us. You know what? The best thing to do for us is to let that go. There's been times when somebody's upset me and I don't say nothing to them and I go around steaming and bubbling and all this kind of stuff and thinking about what I should have said and what I ought to have said and all that stuff. You know, all that's on my side when I should have just said, you know, it don't matter. <laughs> Move on. Let me sleep. Let me go to bed. Let me close my eyes. But I'll be laying in the bed at night thinking, I should have said, I thought them. But the thing about it is, all that's doing is growing up bitterness in my heart, amen, when I should have just let it go. Let it go. Cut it loose. Amen. That happens to all of us. You know, we should strive to be better, not bitter. Amen. <laughs> Here's an amazing thing. God can't bless you when you're bitter. He has a hard time trying to bless you when you're bitter. He honestly does. So holding on to bitterness is no good for any of us. It truly isn't. Amen. Amen. Number six. Every Christian should shelter in Jesus Christ. This is my very last point. But the fact of it is, except ye abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved, as it says in verse 31. When you think about this whole scripture right here, this whole scripture draws us a point, a, a picture, a portrait of salvation. The salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, when the storms rage in life, you know, we can find rest in Jesus Christ. When the fears and doubts arise, we can find shelter in Jesus Christ. Amen. Every Christian should seek Him in a storm. We honestly should. What God promised, He'll never break a promise. Men break promises all the time, but God never will. Amen. You must abide in the ship to be saved. Now, I'm not saying if you're saved tonight and you jump out of the ship, whatever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm like, if you're lost tonight, you better get in the ship. Amen. Jesus is a ship. Guess what happens to this ship here? It gets destroyed. Amen. You know, His, his, uh, his beating He took for us, His stripes is what kills us. Amen. It's His blood that what? makes us right in the Father. Yes, amen. You know, uh, His earthly body was destroyed for our sakes. It truly, honestly was. Gave His life on that cross for us. Jesus, with His own flesh and blood, paid for every one of my sin. Because I am in Jesus Christ, as a little boy, I got in that ship early, I got saved. So tonight I'm here in front of you and I can testify what I got saved. I got saved. I don't know. S-A-V-E-D. Saved. It's done. Amen. That's what the Lord did for me. But the fact of it was, you know, many people today, that hung up on many different things. They're trying to ride in their own little lifeboat. Amen. But the fact of it was, if the Lord gave me a lifeboat I could use on my own and try to do it on my own, I would have perished. I'd have been done gone by now. In Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8, the Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any men should boast. Well, if I could have used the lifeboat, and I could have made it some other way, by going around what Christ had done for me, I'd have something to brag about. But the fact of it is, the Bible tells us there's no way to get there without Him. Amen. Only one way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you think about it, if yours and my little lifeboats were to save us from the storm, we at some point would want to brag about it. We honestly would. Amen. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourself, for it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That's a free gift that's given. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for getting us here tonight. Lord, thank you for the Scripture tonight, Lord. Lord, I ask you to bless us tonight as we went through this... this um preaching tonight, Lord, I ask you to help your people and understanding, Lord, if there's things that were said was confusing or confounding, Lord, Lord, I ask you to help them understand and see these things, Lord. Lord, I ask you to help them get something out of it. Lord, I know I've studied it up and it's helped me to ask you, Lord, if it be your will to help them tonight. Help them grow and draw nigh to you. These things we ask, Lord, in your Son, Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Where are you at, Brother Don? Uh, 187. 187. Alright. Grab your hymnal real quick. Stand up with me if you would. Let's sing page 187. Jesus.
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. He we are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, He who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin, let His children then come in. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Last verse, Jesus loves me, He will stay close beside me all the way thou hast bled and died for me i will henceforth live for thee yes jesus loves me yes jesus loves me Yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you all for putting up with me. And uh, really enjoy being in church. It's such an honor to get to come go to church with you all. I tell you, I have people ask me all the time, how's the ministry going down there? And they always say, how's your ministry going? I'm like, I don't really have a ministry. They have a ministry. I'm just part of it. I'm just happy to be there. And it's going good. I tell them, y'all some of the sweetest people I've ever met. Such a sweet spirit in this church. Really love and seem to really care about one another. That's special. You don't see that everywhere. So I'm really happy to be here with y'all. Thank y'all so much for having me. Brother Tommy, would you dismiss us in prayer, please, sir?